Hello and welcome once again to I'd Like to Know. This is our Bible question and answer program where we get to study the Word of God together. My name is C.A. Murray and it is my privilege and pleasure to welcome you to our all too short sitting together where we study the Word of God. My mentor and, and friend, Pastor Bohr, is not with me today. He is on assignment doing the work of the Lord in uh, another venue, so I am left here to answer your questions by myself, and as I said, it's my privilege and my pleasure to do so. Um, we, your questions, without your questions, we don't have a program. So we want to invite you to share your biblical questions with us. If you have a question that comes from the Word of God, we will plan and uh, to do our very best to answer those questions and uh, try to do so from the Word of God. You don't need to hear the machinations of, of men. What you need is the Word of God. So as we wrestle with your questions, the answers will come from the Word of God. If there is an answer in the Word of God, we will find it, and you will get it from the Word of God. So uh, join us by uh, writing to us. Uh, the address is TV at sumtv.org. That's TV at sumtv, S-U-M-T-V, dot O-R-G. Uh, that's the email address that you need. Write them out. We will do the very best that we can to, uh, to answer them. Uh, many times I find that we end up settling arguments. Uh, it's amaz amazing how Christians will get into little tiffs over the Word of God. But we've got uh, that kind of a question today as one of our questioners has gotten into a little row with a, uh, someone that work, he works with, and um, they've uh, sent in the question to sort of settle the, the issue. Before we go into the question of the Word of God, we're going to have a word of prayer, and then we're going to dive right in and take a look at this, uh, this question. Father God, we do praise you, and we thank you for the, for the privilege that is ours to study the Word of God. We are thankful, Father, that the Word of God can be studied and can be understood, that you don't want to keep any secrets from us, but you want your people to be fully prepared, not only to live this life well, but to prepare for the higher citizenship which is in the world to come. And we know that day is coming soon, so may we be a people of the Word, studiers of the Word, hearers and doers of that Word, that we may be prepared and ready for the second coming of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We love you, praise you, and thank you for your promise to hear and answer the prayer of faith in Jesus' name. Amen. All righty. Uh, interesting <laughs> question. Um, the writer says, I've gotten into a big discussion regarding baptism. Uh, my buddy from work has a totally different belief on baptism than I do. Could you please explain baptism? Uh, and then he says, I, wanted, I want you to touch on the following areas. One, does baptism change you or reveal a change? That's actually a very good question. Does baptism change you or does it reveal a change, uh, as the medical profession would say, a pre-existing condition? Number two, is the method important? Uh, he says sprinkling or just getting wet. I say immersion. And number three, um, do we get baptized into Jesus or into the church? And what is baptism a symbol of if it is indeed a symbol? Well, that is a, a mouthful of questions, and we're going to try to work our way through them in the time that's allotted to us. I think the best way to deal with baptism uh, and what it means and what it does is to take a look at the condition of man prior to baptism and what happens as we move from our natural state towards baptism. So I'm going to ask you to turn with me, if you will, to the book of Isaiah. We want to look at Isaiah chapter 64 and verse 6. Isaiah 64... And verse 6, you've got 66 books in Isaiah, so we're down near the end. As we look at Isaiah 64 and verse 6, I think we want, okay. 
Isaiah 64, 6, the Bible says, and I'm reading from the New King James Version, the Bible says, we are all like an unclean thing. All our righteousness are like filthy rags. We all fade as a leaf, and our iniquities, like the wind, have taken us away. So Isaiah is giving us a picture of the natural state of man. Um, he says, we are all like an unclean thing, and our righteousness are as filthy rags. So he's telling us, without getting too graphic, that the righteousness that we possess, the, the unconverted heart, the unconverted mind, the unconverted life, the unconverted soul is unacceptable to the, to the Lord. It is as dirty garments. Uh, the best we can do is be like dirty garments. The best we can do is, is be unacceptable to the Lord. Since we're in Isaiah, let's go to Isaiah 59 too. Isaiah chapter 59, just back up a couple chapters, and verse 2. For your iniquities have separated you from your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you. Now, the word iniquities has been explained by any number of people. I think the best explanation that I like is iniquity is planned sin. It is sin that is planned and sort of when you kind of sit down in sin, you kind of wallow in sin, you kind of stay in sin. It's planned and executed. Uh, that gives us sort of an idea of what iniquity is. It is not something that just happens on the spur of the moment or something that may happen in, a, in the heat of an action. It's, it's really settling down in sin. And of course, iniquity, the Bible says, Isaiah 59, 2, separate us from our God and our sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear. So sin, planned sin, practiced sin separates us from God. It puts a wall of partition between us and our Lord so that he will not hear. And the Bible says um, uh, in Proverbs that uh, he that uh, doesn't do the law, even his prayer shall be an abomination. So um, we see that sin separates us from God. So our natural state is to be separated from God. Now, if we go to Romans chapter 5, verse 12, Romans 5, verse 12, we are reminded that one's man one man's condition, transgression, landed us all in sin. I'm not going to go in and read that one at the moment because we've got a lot of texts we want to go to. So we are now all in a sinful state. The Bible says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We see that in the same book of Romans. So we are sinners by nature, born in sin, shaped in iniquity. Born in sin, shaped in this sinful cauldron, this sinful way of behold, behaving. Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 9. Let's look at that very quickly. Jeremiah 17, verse 9 gives us a little more on this aspect of, of, um, of sin as part of our innate nature. Um, the Bible says, Jeremiah 17, 9, again, I'm reading from the New King James, the heart is deceitful above, thing, above all things, and desperately wicked, who can know it? So much of the deception that's taking place in the world is us deceiving ourselves. In fact, the hardest battle you will ever be called to fight is the battle against yourself because we as humans can be very self-deceptive when it comes to sin, why we sin, how we sin, and our own sinful nature. So uh, the baddest the hardest battle, rather, that we will fight is the battle against self and uh, against sin in ourselves. Now, Jesus made two statements in the New Testament that are very, very important. We are going over to the book of John. John chapter 3, verse 3, John 3, 3, and John 3, 5. John chapter 3, verse 3, and John chapter 3, verse 5. I'm turning over quickly. John 3 and verse 3. This, of course, is Jesus talking uh, to Nicodemus during their famous night meeting together, uh, discussing the new birth and the new birth experience. Jesus answered and said to him, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. 
Let's go to verse 5. Jesus answered, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of the water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. So we've got a lot packed into those two little verses. One, the first step to renew, to rebirth, to coming back to the Lord is the born again experience. Now, you notice that it doesn't say baptism comes first. Being born again comes first. So that if you are baptized without being born again, you are in effect just taking a bath. You must be born again before baptism. Your heart must be given to the Lord prior to baptism. Uh, you must be one with Christ prior to baptism because that's what comes first. Then he says in verse 5, most assuredly, so he's kind of guaranteed, he's putting a little emphasis on this here. I say to you, unless one is born of the water and the spirit, water indicating baptism and spirit indicating a new birth in Christ Jesus. For that which is born of flesh is flesh. That which is born of the spirit is spirit. Uh, being born of the spirit means surrendering to Jesus Christ, letting Christ come into your life. Then you want to be baptized. What does baptism do is the question. We know we must be born again. That happens through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Let's go to Matthew very quickly. I want to jump back to Matthew 28, 19. This, of course, is the Great Commission that you've heard spoken about so many, many times. Matthew 28 and 19. And we get another little piece of the puzzle uh, in this particular uh, text, which is very wonderful, very well known in Christendom, and really one of the foundation texts as it bespeaks Christ's assignment to his disciples, what they were to do in his name. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. So, two things. He says to his disciples, go and make disciples. So the discipling comes first. That means teach them, preach to them, instruct them, have them to surrender, then baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. So in Matthew chapter 28, verse 19, we get an order. Teach them, disciple them, then baptize them. If you baptize without allowing a change to be made, they go down a dry devil and they come up a wet devil. They must come to Christ first, be surrendered to Christ first, have a change of heart and life first. Then once that change is made, then you baptize them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. This is Christ's methodology, but it is also the order that Christ is giving uh, for teaching and preaching and, and then baptizing. It is unfair to baptize someone in Jesus' name without having them turn their heart over to Jesus. If they don't know who Jesus is, and if they haven't given their heart to Jesus, if they are not a follower of Jesus, then it is unfair to baptize them in Jesus' name. It's like joining a club, but you don't know what the club rules are, or getting a driver's license, but you don't know what the rules of the road are. First, you got to know who Jesus is and accept that, then be baptized in Jesus' name. Now, uh, one of the questions that our writer talks about is, um, is what method of baptism? Uh, do you just get sprinkled? Do you just get splashed? I've seen uh, on television and some other places, uh, people get squirted with a water hose. Some people get baptized with rose petals. What does the Bible say about baptism? You're in the New Testament. Let's go to the book of Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 5. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 5. I'm at Corinthians, Philippians. We'll back up here just a little bit to Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 5. There is, the Bible says, there is one body and one spirit 
just as you were called in one hope of your calling. Now, here's the, the key verse, verse 5. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. Now, um, there's a couple of things you can take away from this. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. Is it talking about one in number or one in kind? Uh, very interesting question, and that's why your point number two comes out. Um, baptism is to be done by immersion. When you look at the Bible record of Christ's baptism, the Bible says he took him down into the water and then brought him up out of the water. That precludes sprinkling, being baptized with a fire hose, being baptized with a garden hose, being baptized with uh, rose petals, being baptized with uh, avocado leaves, uh, all of these many ways that people baptize people. First, water has to be present. Um, the Bible indicates water for baptism because baptism is a symbol of something that we're going to talk about in just a moment. So water has to be present. You have to go down in the water so that you can come up out of the water. Um, it's very, very important. Now, is it, when the Bible says one Lord, one faith, one baptism, is it saying that you can only be baptized once? Well, we know that is not so because we look at the book of Acts, Chapter 19, I'm going to do this very fast. I see my time is getting away from me. Acts chapter 19, and look at verses 2 through 5. So does the one mean one kind of baptism, or does the, the word mean number one or only one baptism? Uh, I'll say here, I was baptized twice. I was baptized at, at uh, nine years of age, and then when I went away to college and got a, a little greater understanding, and prepared myself for the ministry, I was baptized a second time. So is there biblical reason or rationale for doing that? I'm in Acts chapter 19. Let's look at verse 2. Well, let's look at verse 1. We'll read it all. Uh, and it happened while Apollos was at Corinth that Paul, having passed through the upper regions, came to Ephesus and finding some disciples there, said to them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? Were you baptized in the name of the Holy Spirit when you believed on Jesus Christ? They said to him, we have not so much as heard whether there be a Holy Spirit. So they were not familiar, they were not conversant with the doctrine of the Holy Spirit at all. Didn't know anything about it. Um, and then verse 3. So he said to them, into what then were you baptized? They said, into John's baptism. Now, when John the Baptist, that's what he's talking about. When John the Baptist baptized, he talked about the coming kingdom of Jesus Christ. So they were baptized into a knowledge that Christ was here, that his kingdom was coming, and they were baptized into Jesus. Uh, so they said into John's baptism. Now I'm in verse 4. Then Paul said, John indeed baptized with the baptism of repentance. So they were baptized, repentance of their sins saying to the people that they should believe in him who would come after him that is on Jesus Christ. So they heard about Christ, they were given knowledge of Jesus Christ, and they were baptized into that knowledge. Now let's pick it up at verse 5. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Uh, and when Paul had laid hands on them, the Spirit came upon them, and they spoke with tongues and prophesied. All right. So as they got new light, as they got new understanding, they were baptized into that new understanding. They were baptized into this new understanding that the Spirit of God was sent to seal their faith and to help them grow in Jesus Christ and the knowledge that they had. So they were, the Bible tells us that they had been baptized, so now they were baptized a second time. All right, let's plug that back into the text, one Lord, one faith, one baptism from Ephesians 4, 5. They were baptized more than one time because they got new light and a new understanding. So the term one there doesn't mean one time. It means one method, one type of baptism. And that type of baptism, as we've already mentioned, is to be fully immersed into uh, the water and under the water. Let's take a quick look at Mark chapter 1 and try to just 
put a little pin in this for a second. I'm in Mark chapter 1, in the book of Mark, and I'm at chapter 1, and we want to go to verse 9. Chapter 1, verse 9, Mark says, It came to pass in those days that Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And immediately coming up from the water, he saw the heavens parting and the Spirit descending upon him like a dove. All right. To come up from or out of the water can only be done if you have previously gone down into or under the water. So we're getting an idea here. Mark is telling us not only what was done, but how it was done. Jesus wasn't doused with a bucket of water. He wasn't sprayed by a hose. He was laid down in the Jordan under the water, and then he came up out of the water. And John is, or rather Mark is saying, once he came out of the water, that the Spirit of God landed upon him like a dove. So um, we get the methodology here. True Bible baptism means going under the water and coming up out of the water. Now, why is that important? It's important for at least two reasons. One, the symbolism that is involved. You remember most of the people back in Bible times were, um, were illiterate. They didn't read. They didn't write. So much of what was done was done symbolically to give them an understanding of what God wanted from them. This is also very true in the temple. When they went to the temple, they were also going to school because God was teaching them through the colors, the signs, the symbols in the sanctuary, in the temples, what he wanted them to do. Same with baptism. They went down under the water, came up from the water as a symbol of the death, burial, and resurrection uh, to sin. You go down into the water, you hold your breath for a number of seconds, and then you come up out of the water in newness, newness of life. So it's a symbol of dying to sin and being born again. That symbol is very, very important. You can't get that symbol with a fire hose. You can't get that symbol with a water hose. You've got to go down under the water and come up from the water as a symbol of being born again into newness of life. Of life. Christ calls us to follow him in this example. Let's look at Romans 15 4. Romans 15 4. Book of Romans, Acts, and then Romans chapter 15, and we go to verse 4. For whatever things are written before were written for our learning, that through the patience and comfort of the scriptures, we might have hope. In other words, these things that we see in the Bible are not just idle words and idle texts. They were written down for our admonition, for our growth, for our practice, for our learning. So when you see a methodology outlined in the Bible, it's not there by accident. It's there because there is symbolism, because there is meaning, and because these are things that God wants us to do to fulfill righteousness. I'm in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 11. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 11. Now all these things happened to them as examples, and they were written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the ages have come. So these things that happened in the word of God were written as examples for us to follow. And it fulfills righteousness. So when someone sees you get baptized, here's what they're witnessing. They're witnessing the outward working of an inward change. Something has happened in your life. They might not know when it happened. They might not know how it happened. But your being baptized into the Lord Jesus says that something has happened. Your life has been changed. Your life has been surrendered to Christ and baptism is the outward sign of an inward change. Something has happened. Usually if they study your life as a Christian, they can see that something is new. But baptism is the public statement. It's the, it's the fanfare, the inauguration. It doesn't change you, really. It says to the world that a change has already taken place. 
Something has happened in your life, and you now want the world to know. So baptism is, can we say, like the coming out party? It's the party that says, yes, I've got a new forever friend, as a good friend of mine likes to call him. His name is Jesus Christ. I am now one with him. Now, let's look at a, a, an example. We're back in the book of Acts. We're back in the book of Acts, chapter 8, and verses 38 and 39. I know our time is getting away from us. Acts chapter 8, verses 38 and 39. 38 and 39. This is a story of Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch. Um, uh, let's look at verse 38. So he commanded the chariot to stand still, and both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and he baptized him. See, they went down into the water, and he baptized him. Now when they came up out of the water, here's that same language that we saw with Christ. When they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught Philip away, so that the eunuch saw him no more. Again, we have a methodology. We have not only what happened, but how it happened. A methodology, they went down into the water, came up out of the water. Water baptism uh, is the not only preferred method, it is the method outlined by Christ for his disciples and for those who would be children of the Most High God. Romans chapter 6, verse 45, uh, tells us that baptism brings us into likeness of Jesus Christ. Now, I've got a lot more text, but uh, we will not be able to look at them all. Um, Let's close with John chapter 1, verse 12. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John chapter 1 and verse 12. And I'm looking at chapter 12, verse 1. I want chapter 1, verse 12. Chapter 1 and verse 12. Here we go. John chapter 1, verse 12. The Bible says, um, But as many as received him, to them gave he the right or the power to become the children of God. The first thing we've got to do, brothers and sisters, is receive him, accept him, love him, follow him, serve him, uh, become a child of his. Let Christ have his way and work in your life. Once you've done that, then you need to find a good Bible-believing church to get baptized into. Uh, the question was also asked, are we baptized into a church or are we baptized into Jesus Christ? Actually, here's the answer. You're baptized into Jesus Christ. You're baptized into the fellowship and the family of God. But most churches vote to accept your fellowship, your membership into that particular body as you are baptized in Jesus Christ. So you're, you're joining Jesus, but when you join Jesus, you also join a good Bible-believing church. I hope that answers all your questions. Our time has fast slipped into eternity. We'll see you again soon. Bye-bye, and God bless.